back everyone to We Heart Therapy. You're watching the special series for therapists EFT Talk. I'm your host, Annabelle Bugatti, licensed marriage and family therapist in Las Vegas, Nevada, and certified emotionally focused couples therapist. We have back to our show another uh, exciting episode, and you probably recognize Dr. Katherine Ring. Mm. She's been on our series for another video, and she's also the director of the Washington Baltimore Center for Emotionally Focused Therapy, and she's a trainer and supervisor in EFT. If you haven't checked out her training tapes on withdrawal reengagement, make sure you check those out on her website. Welcome back, Dr. Katherine Reen. Thanks so much. Great being back. So today we're going to talk about how to explain EFT to our clients because I know a lot of therapists sort of get stuck, especially when they're just learning EFT. When Everything we know about it, we've learned in these externships, the core skills, we've taken seminars and watched videos and read books and, you know, it's <laughs> so much. It's like, oh my gosh, how do I condense this into a right. little elevator pitch when my couple walks in and says, hey, you know, we're looking for a couples therapist. We Googled you, mm -hmm. you know, you came up and it, you sounded really good. So here we are. And you yeah. say, I'm an emotionally focused therapist. And they're like, okay. Great. What does that mean? Yeah. What does being an emotionally focused therapist mean? Um, so I, I um, am always very happy to talk with a client or a potential client for a couple of minutes um, to give them, quote unquote, the elevator speech. My elevator speech is different each time I say it. And, um, you know, I should probably get it down better. But I talk about, so I'll just talk at a higher level and then be able to work my way into some of the things I actually say to potential clients. But I certainly want them to know that attachment theory is, that EFT is based on attachment theory mm -hmm. and that attachment theory is relevant for all humans. Mm -hmm. Because you're, you're human and you're breathing, you have attachment needs, fears, and longings. And usually what, what throws partners into distress is one or both partners not getting some of those attachment needs, fears, and longings met. And what humans do when those longings aren't getting met, it leads us to pain and fear. And of course, as we now know from the science, unprocessed pain and fear tweak our behaviors. And so then we end up with the one who matters most, which is super interesting. The one who matters most, we end up interacting with each other in ways that lead us to feel really disconnected that leave us feeling really alone and maybe even questioning our love for each other. When, when we, I also talk, I love saying this, and maybe you've heard me say this before, but emotion is the messenger of love. Mm -hmm. And that can throw some people, but I really want them to know what they're getting when they come to work in an EFT session. Of course, transparency is everything for us. Um, but because I say things like, because you love your loved one, because you love your partner or some other family member, we need to help you know a bit about what you feel on the inside and share it in a way that your partner can hold it. Mm -hmm. In distress, lots of us share a whole soup of secondary emotion, you know, that fast moving reactive emotion that pushes your loved one away. And in EFT, what we'll work to do is get each of you from secondary emotion, a soup of secondary into more distilled primary. And when we share parts of primary emotion with each other, and we then, I help your partner learn how to hold it, it creates bonding moments. I've never met a relationship that couldn't benefit from more bonding moments. And so vulnerability to vulnerability, that's the Velcro that all couples need. And we all need more of it. Life is hard. Life is stressful. We work a lot. We hardly see each other. You know, even, even, I think it was a Surgeon General in the U.S. came out recently and saying there's an epidemic of loneliness because in the U.S. people spend the majority of their time at work. To all the bosses and managers and CEOs out there, please let your employees make a friend at work mm -hmm. to help these, this epidemic of loneliness. And so we, in our love relationships, need to be able to capitalize on our love so we actually get the benefits. Mm -hmm. The neurological, the immunological, the heartfelt benefits of your love for each other. That's really good. And I, I know a lot of clients come in, they say, we're looking to work on communication, right? Mm -hmm. And EFT does actually work on communication through disentangling this process. Yeah. So how might you incorporate a little spiel about communication into your 
elevator speech. Yeah, I say actually I address how you communicate with each other from session one. I include communication as a large part of each couple's interactional pattern. And of course, we're emotionally focused. And so we're looking at the emotion that fuels or drives or urges or compels a communication and or the emotion triggered when hearing a communication. But I feel very comfortable reassuring people that we will work on your communication with each other, but we will work on it in an experiential manner, a bottom up manner by prioritizing the emotion that drives the communication or the responses to the communication. I, I will say that I want to be really fair that we don't teach communication skills top down. We don't say, here's what you should say in this situation. That's way too content oriented for us. In EFT, we're a process consultant. We're a consultant to your relationship. Your relationship is our client. And so our job as your process consultant is to track the process that you two get caught in. Really in a key moment when one or both of you needs reassurance, when one or both of you needs to know, actually not just know, but feel the other one has your back. And so communication, I mean, one of, one of the hallmarks of emotional dysregulation is an inability to communicate clearly or an inability to meta-process or meta-communicate. It's communication is impacted significantly by emotional distress. And so, of course, your communication will feel unsuccessful when you guys are emotionally disconnected and distressed with each other. I like that. It's a really good way of putting that in there. And I noticed too, um, you know, in your withdraw re-engagement tapes, you actually use the words like withdrawer and pursuer, protester. Yeah. And we yeah. saw the clients repeating those words. Yeah. And I think as therapists, and you also mentioned this in the other video that we did about we don't operate for, um, behind an iron curtain. And I sort yeah. of feel like as therapists, we sort of get this idea that maybe in some ways we are, that there's like the stuff that the therapist knows that doesn't reveal mm -hmm. to the client, like about mm -hmm. how we do things like the therapist talk. And mm -hmm. then there's a second set of language that we give to the client. And it sounds mm -hmm. like very much in, in the way that you explain it to clients is that you sort of merge the two and yeah. be transparent. And a lot of us are struggling to know how transparent do we get with yeah. Clients. So how do you explain the protest or pursuer, which are a thing? Yeah, um, I, I have one way of being, and that's just me. And while that's totally imperfect, I tried so hard to not talk to my clients as if they were an EFT training. Um, and, and mostly I think I do okay, but I, I teach clients the model as we do it. Um, as they're experiencing it, we label things. We, I want them to have the handholds of knowing we're working on withdrawal re-engagement. I want the pursuer to know that then we'll do a similar process in order to help them soften. I am more, I'm told I'm more transparent than most people are mm -hmm. accustomed to. And I'm not sure, I'm just told that. I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. But my level of transparency is always on their behalf. And so while I'm more transparent than maybe many are, I'm also very aware that my transparency always has to be in service of the client. Mm -hmm. And so, but of course, in our humanistic model, we're working, you know, we're processing clients' limbic experience through our own limbic system. I get water in my eyes. I'm touched by the things they say. I have some emotional responses on behalf of them. They're touching me. They're impacting me. I'm really, really grateful that EFT allows for that, that I can be me. I, in fact, I have to be me, mm -hmm. not prioritizing myself, right. but that enough of, I bring myself to the room. You can be I authentic bring, and genuine. Authentic and genuine is a must. I mean, that's what our alliance building is based on. And so early in my learning of EFT, I realized that I, I felt all this pressure to keep their words in my head and to track so thoroughly and I couldn't keep it all in my head. And I, then I realized, wait, why am I keeping this all in my head as if I'm not, I just decided for me, I had to be more transparent. So I asked my clients, could I think out loud for a second? Mm -hmm. 
could I just replay what I thought happened because I need to sift through it inside myself to then help us decide where to go from here. Or we're going to keep collaborating on what's most what's the most relevant use of what's left of the session today. Mm-hmm. So I think out loud, talk, talk obviously out loud, share the process, share what I'm worried about, what just happened. And, and I, I remember this from you and I remember that from you. It happened so fast and I want to slow us all down. There are beautiful richness here. We have about 10 minutes left. How would it feel if we prioritize this piece for these 10 minutes and then we'll pick up next week with these other pieces? Mm-hmm. Like I have to just talk process because otherwise I don't know how to do it and stay in contact with them, stay in experiential contact with them. Mm-hmm. And so do you actually, like in one of the first few sessions, explain, oh, so you're the withdrawer and this is what that means and you're the pursuer and that's what this means? Yeah, even in a first session, I love the phrase and the phenomenon of working hypothesis. And so right off the bat, I'm establishing a working hypothesis and I talk about it as such and I ask for input and I say, please revise me, please correct me, please edit any and everything I'm saying. I want, while I'm talking in generalities and we have words, pursue, withdraw are approximations for the anxious and avoidant adult attachment styles. And I'll say that. I'll say we have words that are common for us, but if the words don't fit or they don't feel good, nobody likes to be stereotyped or labeled. But in order to get the conversation started between the three of us, I notice I tend to use the general words and then you can, we can revise based on what feels best to each of you. And we know from Sue's early studies that 80% of couples have a pursue withdrawal pattern. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm listening for that. I'm looking for that. But of course we know there are two withdrawers who do beautifully together until something happens and they don't have a lot of experience leaning on each other. We know about complex cycles and patterns. We know about reactive patterns. So, you know, occasionally there can be two attack or attack attack parts of the pattern. And um, so they're different. Of course, they're different patterns, but I love the working hypothesis. It takes all the pressure off that I'm noticing, I'm observing, I'm tracking and reflecting. I'm making meaning. I want to share the meaning I'm making to see if it fits for them. Mm-hmm. I want to develop. This is, I'm doing all of this while I'm building an alliance. So I'm doing all of this in a very collaborative way. How does this sound? Mm-hmm. How does it, lots of women don't like the word pursuer, um, but it's better than blame or softening. Um, and, you know, um, the same thing with a version of different content, but with withdrawers doesn't mean I don't love, doesn't mean I'm indifferent, right? I was like, of course not. It, remember, these are just coping strategies in your worst moments. If I was a fly on the wall, what would I see you do when you need reassurance from your partner, but you can't get it? You're not getting it. All of us cope in a predictable way in those moments. That's a key moment for you in your relationship. I just want to get a sense of your coping strategy. Help me know how you cope. Mm -hmm. And so I'll use their words. And then sometimes at the end of the first session, I might feel enough clarity that would, and we might, it might unfold in a way where I have a minute to share my working hypothesis. Um, and then certainly in the individual sessions, I'll check it out with them further. How did my reflection of a possible pattern that you guys get caught in, how did that sit with you? Mm-hmm. How does that reverberate, resonate on the inside? Mm-hmm. What parts have, am I missing? What do you want to revise or edit? Of course, it's just a start. I'll get to know it much better as we continue. How do you, so if they ask you what is, you know, like um, the anxious uh, attachment style or the avoidant Mm -hmm. attachment style, if they ask you, what does that mean? How would you explain that to them? Yeah, that um, the anxious attachment style is the one who copes by turning up the emotional heat. The anxious one will be the first one to smell smoke and will want to check it out. And we'll, you know, we tend to amplify things until we know they don't need to be amplified. And that's your survival strategy. And it makes perfect sense that you're going to want more reassurance. You're going to want to talk more about the state of your connection, the state of the union, which here in DC, that has a whole different meaning sometimes, but um, most clients get the double entendre of that. Um, Mm -hmm. With the withdrawer, again, as in terms of a coping strategy that we all learn to cope and ways that are very healthy, adaptive, normal, normative, 
and get us through lots of life doing really well. The hard part though, that love makes us interdependent because you love, you're interdependent. And I wanna help you guys see what you each do in your moments where one needs more from Bowlby's concept, Bowlby's term of effective dependence. How does your interdependency play out in a stressful relational moment? And so what do you each do? So for the withdrawer, I will say it makes perfect sense that you cope by shutting down, tamping down, trying to turn off the emotional heat. Mm -hmm. Maybe your partner copes by turning up the emotional heat. And this, without interrupting this pattern, this is just going to be distressing. It's going to make you feel worse. Mm -hmm. And so, and often we get more extreme. The pursuers are known to, you know, try to explain their position in eight different ways. We get repetitive. Withdrawers are known to shut down even more and work longer hours or stay out of the house to avoid the pursuit. So it, what we're doing in the first handful of EFT sessions is really getting that process clear. That pattern of organizing it, right? Organizing it organizing a little bit about what drives your steps in the dance for each of you. I want to know the underlying emotion. That's our step three, the underlying emotion that drives your behaviors of step two. So I say that in trainings all the time, but because I train regularly, I often end up saying that with clients. Mm -hmm. And so, and then I go, Oh, I wish I hadn't said step three, step two, but there's no harm in them knowing. Right. Right. And so what I need to do, you do verbal. So you, you don't, necessarily intentionally tell the client step two step three sometimes it comes out because you train I, I yeah. understand hazard of the trade <laughs> yes you know, exactly yeah it sounds like though you do actually explain to them pursuer softening and withdraw re-engagement right? yes so like, I explain Mm -hmm. Yeah, I explain that what, uh, you know, in three minutes ish, you know, what we'll be doing in stage one and how we work to help couples get deescalated. And then, then in stage two, how we'll start with withdrawal reengagement and then work to get the, the withdrawer in your relationship reengaged and then go over to the pursuer to get them to soften and share their vulnerabilities. And so we're working towards your version of mutual accessibility and responsiveness, mm -hmm. of course, from Bowlby's tenets of attachment theory. And so they'll, the, each partner has let me know their longings. And so I'll try to use as many of their words as possible, what mutual accessibility and responsiveness feels like, looks like to them, what they believe they need, what they long for. I like that because, you know, and oftentimes I'll, Sometimes when I feel like they're on different pages about that, I will sit and say, okay, can we just sit for a second and talk about what your ideas of how you each define like close emotional connection? Because sometimes they'll have very different definitions. Yeah. Let's try to create one together so we know that we're working towards the same thing. So I love that you say we're going to find what it looks like for you and, and how you guys want to do this. That's yeah. Great. Yeah, we have to remember while, of course, we're assessing their goals and making sure their goals are aligned enough to not be working against each other, um, we have to remember that a pursuer is going to express his or her goal or longing probably differently than a withdrawer would. And it doesn't mean that they're working at cross purposes or not aligned. But we have to, oh, and even if for me in my first session, the way I ask about therapeutic goals is help me know what you long for with each other. Mm -hmm. And so I'm using the word longings. We don't really use it in our culture much. Um, it's but evocative, we but we have them, right? Cradle to grave. Mm -hmm. it's despite, you know, my frame on trauma enduring more than most, I'm just amazed that some of my clients who are trauma survivors and what they've endured that they still long for connection. Yeah. And I really love using the word longing because I feel like it just beautifully captures that desire, you know, and I, and I do use that word. And I love the way that you put that. Help me to understand what you each long for. In, with mm -hmm. each other in this relationship that's really yeah helpful. paint me a picture of your longings and some people look at me longings and i'll say your heart's desire mm -hmm. what's what does your heart hold paint this picture for me of what your heart's image is of you two right. being so connected or you two being your best selves with each other right 
But that's data for me that the word longing is so foreign for a particular person. Right. And so I'm collecting data about a potential attachment style right off the bat. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. So when you explain like pursuer softening, you're going to talk about helping the pursuer to share you know, their experience in a vulnerable way, not so much of an angry kind of poking way. Yeah, I say that, um, you know, as we head through stage two, I'll start with doing withdrawal re-engagement, which is what the theory teaches us to do first and help the withdrawing partner, the friend, let's just say it to him, his inner world and share, share it so his partner knows more my dissertation which was a preliminary task analysis of the withdrawal re-engagement process the first one that um our eft community had you know first one first analysis done this nick lee my colleague who i presented with at the summit has done the second one and it's a fantastic um addition you know we we've learned that to, we've learned that we want to get the pursuer and the pursuing partner to invite slash encourage the withdrawer to go deeper. And so now I'll say to the pursuer, how would it be to get to know some of your partner's inner world, some of the withdrawers in our world mm -hmm. to help it feel more relevant to the withdrawer? Because remember, most withdrawers don't feel the need to go deeper mm -hmm. individually. Mm -hmm. But when they feel that it would help their partner, this is exactly what I've been hoping for. This is why I've been such a nag. This is why I've been so pokey or so blamey or so critical. Yeah. Then it's like that step four again. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And so, um, yeah, so I'll explain a few sentences about helping the withdrawn partner get engaged. And then I'll talk about the pursuing partner goes from slowing through stage one to softening in stage two. And that through the slowing into softening process, we want to get the pursuer's focus back to, I'll just say her, could be him too, back to her inner world to get the underbelly of her emotions, her softer emotions that of course, you know, she has many words. Pursuers are often very verbal, have many words about what's not working and what's not enough, what's what they still need more of. But what's often excluded in this coping strategy or in these conversations when a pursuer is coping is the underlying vulnerability. I'm so afraid I'm not as important to you mm -hmm. as I used to be, or as you are to me, or as I wanna feel. I get so afraid. So we talk about the softening process is I'll help you lead with your vulnerabilities up and running. So you're turned to your partner and share your fears of being unimportant, share your fear of not mattering with the fear up and running. And so it's a very vulnerable, it's a deep, that's the deep end of the emotional swimming pool that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you're gonna let them know, we're not just gonna like drop kick you off into the deep yes. end of the pool. We're gonna go slow through the shallow end first. <laughs> that's right, and we work methodically from the shallow end to the middle water to the deeper water. And sometimes we go back to the middle water. Mm -hmm. On my training tape, the softening with that man, um, it's it's like that we start in the shallow of step five and it's hard for me to get experiential traction with step five but we do get experiential traction and i think we're going to go deep pretty quickly and then we don't and we spend a couple sessions navigating the middle depth of the water mm -hmm. i do actually use the pool analogy when i'm blocking the exit sometimes when i uh -huh. see that they're walking around the pool i say right now i sort of see you walking around the pool I, yep. I know you put your toes in and you're debating as to whether or not to get in, right? I see you. I see you right now walking around that pool and I keep trying to invite you in and it doesn't seem like you're ready to get in. What's going on? <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, that's a lovely process comment that all EFT therapists need to be able to make because of course you're tracking the process mm -hmm. and talking in metaphor or analogy makes it safer mm -hmm. and a little bit easier or it's a more gentle way to reflect. Mm -hmm wondering hey what's going on this is hard for you to follow my lead or it's hard for you to jump right in or it's hard for you to go where i'm hoping we can go mm -hmm. yeah. that's a beautiful way it sounds like sometimes too if we if we feel like we're lost and we're not sure sure what we're doing 
I know that you say come back to tracking the cycle, but sometimes it's good to reflect the process that's happening. It's like, I feel like I'm trying to do this with you, but something's just not right. Mm -hmm. Please reflect the present moment. Mm -hmm. In stage one, it makes sense when you're stuck to track the cycle, but in a stage two session, mm -hmm. if you go back to tracking the cycle, you'll lose some focus and momentum. And it makes perfect sense. This is a, a, a common thing that EFT clinician has to do. I'm asking for my client to do too much. Mm -hmm. They're not able to do it. Let me slice it thinner. And a great way of slicing it thinner is saying, it seems to me I think we're on the edge of the pool rather than getting in the pool. So let me slow myself down. At least this is what I say to me or say to my clients. Let me see if I can help you out better. Mm -hmm. How is this process for you? How is it for you that I'm not letting up on my focus right how is it for you that i'm continually in repetitive but slightly different ways mm -hmm. needing data from your inner world how is it that i keep trying to be curious mm -hmm. and so i'll talk process and evoke about the process right right that's a really great great place to go and and, and i love that so much and um, I had a thought and now my, my brain just like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm trying to think if I can get, if I can get the, the thought back on. Okay. <laughs> it, it was something about the process. Oh, um, so some of the other things that we might need to explain to the clients about EFT or how mm -hmm. our process works as they come up. A question I get oftentimes from clients, and, and I'm positive others do as well, is, so again, why is it so important for me to talk about my emotions, or, you know, why do we need to, why is this important? Why do I need to feel them? What is that going to do? What would you yeah. say in that? Yeah, it's some very simplistic, essential level. Because you love, you have to send an emotional signal. And I know that's not what we learned in middle school and high school or college. And so lots of times people come to therapy to help them help themselves and their partner learn how to send emotional signals mm -hmm. that helps them both feel better. Like we, we want you to feel the benefits of your love. Mm -hmm. And when the signal gets all scrambled up, it's really hard to get the benefits of your love relationship. And so the only reason I, again, I wish we could focus on a different level. I wish it wasn't all about the emotion, but the science is really clear at this point. Mm -hmm. And since emotion has control precedence neurologically, that's edtronic. Since the cognitive brain is not nearly potent enough to talk the emotional brain out of its experience, mm -hmm. we in EFT work in concert with how the human nervous system is wired mm -hmm. to not only work, but to thrive. And so that's why, because we want you to thrive with each other, that's why we have to work on an emotional level. Right. I really like that how you say that the cognitive level isn't quite potent enough to talk the, the emotional part out of its experience, which is so true. It's so true. And, and I've brought that up to clients before. We can talk about it from a distance, but it doesn't yeah. quite change that experience. No matter how much yeah. we try to reason with their partner why they shouldn't feel hurt, we try to take the hurt away <laughs> from them in that way. But it never comes close. We can That's right. Close in the face, but it's That's not right. the fact that they were hurt. <laughs> yeah, and that hurt just needs to be held. Mm -hmm. And when you load share the hurt and you get some co-regulation around the hurt, it really starts to change it. It starts to shrink. It starts to transform. It starts to go into sad or, or fear or anger even. But it's, it's like we can't – so many times people – good people, good-hearted, well-meaning people tried to talk me out of feeling what I feel. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I wish it worked. I wish I didn't feel what I felt. It, life would be easier. Yeah. But now we know, and I'm so grateful to the science because now we know mm -hmm. just how biologically hardwired our survival is and how emotions are the best GPS for our survival. It's so beautiful. I love it you say that. Yeah, we have to make friends with our emotions mm -hmm. to ensure our own survival. And so at some essential level, there's no way to go through life without referencing your emotions. Right. I've often had to tell my clients, and it's so funny because I have quite a few, quite a lot actually, professional athletes, and they're all into like uh, Tony Robbins. Yeah. And they go to all these <laughs> self-development 
seminar yeah. yet they're so out of touch with their emotions and they go back to you know let's just be positive and uh, and they're all in the mental toughness and i tell them look mental toughness is not the same thing as emotional avoidance it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that you avoid feeling it it means you are aware and comfortable with acknowledging that you feel this way and confident enough that we can find our way out of this way. yeah lovely yeah. lovely and it's it's just so funny so when you're really trying to tell them look we know that we have emotions for a reason for yeah. you it may not feel like it helps you function but they do serve a utility they send very oh, yeah. important messages to you that hey look this needs to be looked at Let's yeah. stop here and pay attention for a second. Yes, of course. It, all the more important in any love relationship. Mm -hmm. All the more important. In fact, there's no way around paying attention to the emotional signal. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like when therapists are trying to figure out their own semblance of their elevator speech to their clients, is that maybe yeah. some important components to touch on are what we know about the importance of bonding. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what we know about the presence or absence of emotional signals. Yes. And what the science teaches us about, you know, not, you know, not paying attention to emotions or the relevance, the salience of emotions, how they are like carriers and, you know, part of the human experience that we mm -hmm. really need to work with mm -hmm. and the importance of that and sort of outlining you know where we're going to start where we're going to go what the goals are in general in terms mm -hmm. of like you know helping their bond to move from distressed and insecure unstable to secure and mm -hmm. close and intimate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whatever words they want to use maybe using mm -hmm. the the culturally relevant terms for their area sure oh and however simplistic or more cognitive you know uh mm -hmm. scott woolley calls them high dollar words <laughs> uh -huh. dollar yeah. clients, they might appreciate those high dollar words but if uh -huh. you're in some rural part of the u.s they may not they'd be like what <laughs> yes <laughs> use them. so yeah you know, this, you know touching on again the bonding the importance and utility of emotions what we know from science how that teaches us about both of those and how EFT combines and integrates those in a way and that we're going to work, you know, maybe we'll talk about communication. We're going to talk about bonding, closeness, sharing our inner worlds um, and, you know, the process that goes through and you are very, very um, direct and clear about it. Maybe in a way that more folks are, but it's really a matter of preference, right? Yeah. Do whatever they'd like. And, I love how you also mentioned, okay, you know, when we get to stage two or when you get to stage two, you're going to talk about, we're going to help you as the pursuer, you know, maybe slow down and expose more of that underbelly. I like how you say mm -hmm. the underbelly, that vulnerability mm -hmm. that comes up for you in a way that's more clear for your partner. Because mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. again, what we know from stage one is they get lost through that, yes. day, that prodding, right? And, yes. You know, and, and for the withdrawal, we're going to help you really re-engage in a way and send some emotional signals or pings, crumbs, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. in a way that helps your partner feel more secure. And this yeah. is all on behalf of the relationship to help build and strengthen the bond. Yeah, beautifully said. The uh, one piece that I would add that we haven't talked about so far, um, but just a, just another minute to add this piece in is EFT's research. Mm -hmm. That we're very, we're very proud of our research. Sue and her colleagues have worked incredibly hard for decades now. Our research is very clear. We meet the gold standard from APA's perspective for evidence-based. I like telling my clients or potential clients that it's not therapy a la Catherine Ream. Mm -hmm. or what I think they need, but I, I love our model and I love that I lean on our model and our science and our research and I trust it. That's my guide, guiding, mm -hmm. guide, I don't know the better words, but that it's, it's knowing, mm -hmm. compass, exactly. That's much better, thank you. So I like talking about, we are not only have great outcomes in terms of the percent of people who not only recover, but actually are much happier, more satisfied, recovered from distress, but also much more satisfied. So we have great outcome research, but we also know how to do the therapy session by session. Not many couples therapy studies the process of change or the task analysis that we have for which our engagement, pursuer softening, and attachment injury repair model. 
the, and the level of linkage between in session change and outcomes is unusual in our field. It's, 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 one, it's one of the other facets of EFT that sets it apart. A lot of people do couples therapy without getting trained. A lot of couples therapy is offered without rigorous research behind it. Mm -hmm. So I love talking about our research and directing people to the research also that I want them to know as an educated consumer. Mm -hmm. um, That's a really excellent point. And I love, I also love mentioning the research to the clients. I always, I love, I love how you said the word gold standard. And I use that because, mm -hmm. you know, when I say I'm offering you the gold standard of couples counseling. Yes. Like, oh yeah. We need to stay with this lady. Yeah. She's giving us something, you know, and I say, yes. That's why I use EFT because we know that it works and I'm not going to offer you something that's going to slap a bandaid on and you're going to walk out of here and not be effective. I want to give you something that we know is works and proven effective. Not, yeah. Well said. Excellent. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you so much again for being part of our series. Now remind us, you know, what's the website so folks can look up your training videos? Yeah, I'd appreciate it. Um, it's the Washington Baltimore Center for EFT. So WBCEFT.com. And right on the homepage is information and about the training videos. It's two packages. One is three and a half hours. So withdrawal re-engagement is three and a half hours. The pursuer softening is four. But a little bit about this one couple's real life journey through the heart of stage two, and then how to access the videos, how to become a subscriber, which will give you access to them as many times as you'd like in the subscription period. So I'm honored to be able to share their beautiful hearts and the good work that they did in therapy and um, hope it's a relevant educational tool for clinicians interested in EFT or those who are already EFT therapists who want to get specific focus on stage two. Excellent. And guys, I've, I've subscribed to these videos. They are amazing, amazing. Mm. So make sure that you check out her website and that you take a look at her videos. I will put a link to the website in this description for this video. Thank you again so much, Dr. Katherine Rehm, for joining us today. Thank you Thank again you. so much to our viewers and the therapists who love EFT and who are interested in EFT. Keep watching our series and subscribe to the channel because more episodes are on the way. Thanks. <laughs>